Hey everyone, my name is Wedge, and today we have a bunch of cards to go over as we get closer and closer to knowing the entire set. Let's start with a new common cycle. This morning, five fonts were revealed, one of each color, and they all cost one colorless and one mana of each of their respective colors. They're all also enchantments, so from this point forward, I'll just be focusing on their names and abilities rather than mana costs and card types. Font of Vigor's ability lets you pay 3 and sacrifice it to gain 7 life. This is reminiscent of Heroes Reunion, which I've seen some people play in Limited and actually work decently well. Past some fringe play there, I'm not sure it'll gain any traction. Font of Fortunes lets you pay 2 and sacrifice it to draw 2 cards. This is more my speed. Great for Limited as any card advantage is welcome, you don't even have to use the ability immediately. Just save it for a rainy day when you need more cards. That's probably the biggest upside to this cycle. You can just hang out waiting for the right time to use them. Font of Return's ability is pretty interesting. You can pay four and sacrifice it to return up to three target creature cards from your graveyard to your hand. This works really well with Farika's Mender in addition to just being good by itself. In Limited, being able to get three creatures back is huge card advantage. Sure, the ability is a bit clunky at four mana, but by the time you have enough creatures in your yard to get full value out of this, you should have more than enough mana. I like this one. Fawn of Ire's ability is basically a lava axe for four mana and sacrificing it. The card is fine. Obviously made for limited, which is perfectly reasonable. Yep, it's the lava axe in a bowl. I really have nothing else to say about that. Fawn of Fertility has one of the more interesting abilities. You can pay two and sacrifice it to search your library for a basic land card, put it onto the battlefield tab, then shuffle your library. While this isn't rampant growth, it's still very useful. Like all the other fonts, it can trigger Constellation late game, or just mana ramp and color fix early game in limited. Who knows, if there's a ramp deck in standard that really, really needs a good ramp and growth ability, this could see play in constructed. I'm not entirely sold on that though. So that's our cycle of constellation enablers with spell effects. Moving on, the next card we're looking at is Dictate of Heliod. Three colorless and two white for an enchantment with flash. Creatures you control get plus two plus two. The ability to use this as a combat trick is pretty sweet. The double anthem effect is really powerful and will definitely swing the advantage in your favor. The fact that it stays around is pretty much the best thing ever. It is expensive, which is unfortunate, but I know plenty of limited and commander players who are going to play this to death. I'd love to see this at the top of a curve for standard, but the mana really is just super intensive. Plus it has Spear of Heliod to contend with. You know what they say, too many anthem effects are bet I'm awful at this. God Hunter Octopus is a whopping 6 mana for a 5-5 Octopus. It can't attack unless defending player controls an enchantment or an enchanted permanent. Enchanted permanent means exactly what it says. Anything with a paralyzing grasp on it counts. Underworld connections counts. You get it. This card is weird. I usually expect an upside from these gigantic creatures with can't attack on less abilities. Sealock Monster has Monstrosity. Even Stormtide Leviathan had Island Walk. The point is, the flavor is cool, but the drawback is a little annoying. Still pretty bomby for limited. Next up is Harness by Force. One colorless and two red for a sorcery with Strive, costing three more to cast for each target beyond the first. Gain control of any number of target creatures until end of turn. Untap them. They gain haste. This is cool. Act of Treason, Zealous Conscripts, Portent of Betrayal. This continues a long line of take control effects. Being able to take multiple creatures is really where this card shows its true power. If you use this with the Thaumaturge we saw yesterday, it only costs 2 mana for each additional creature. You can wipe your opponent's board with this. Very strong for limited. Decent sideboard card in Constructed. Effects like this should never be underestimated. Golden Hind is the most adorable 2 mana 2 one on the planet. Look at that cute little elk. Oh, look at- Who's your cutie? You are. Yes, you are. <clears throat> Golden Hind taps to add one green mana to your mana pool. The ability is nice as having mana producers is always good. The problem is that he's two mana. This has been done before. Leaf Gilder back in Lorwyn is a perfect example. Being a 2-1 is nothing to shake a stick at, but the mana cost will probably stop him from seeing play in standard, as Sylvan Karyatid is still a thing. Still, good and limited. We're almost to the end, guys. Next on our list is Desperate Stand. One red and one white mana for a sorcery with Strive, costing one red and one white more to cast for each target beyond the first. 
Any number of target creatures each get plus two plus oh and gain first strike and vigilance until end of turn. Okay, let's talk about the elephant in the room. This is sorcery speed. I have no idea why they chose to do that, but they did. Maybe they did this so people could utilize the vigilance before declaring attackers? Even then, you can cast an instant anytime you could cast a sorcery, so I'm still perplexed. The ability on the card is really strong. The power bonus, the first strike, all of it. Really good, I just have no idea what to do with it. It's so confused. The last card we're looking at today is pretty ridiculous. Disciple of Deceit is one blue and one black for a 1-3 human rogue with Inspired. Whenever it becomes untapped, you may discard a non-land card. If you do, search your library for a card with the same converted mana cost as the card you discarded and put it into your hand. This is Transmute. For those who don't know, Transmute was the Dimir guild mechanic in the original Ravnica block. Basically, you can untap the Disciple, discard your Doomblade, and go get an ultimate price instead. Because when Desecration Demon really needs to die, Doomblade in hand is an awkward place to be. The point of this card is to filter through your deck for the right cards at the right time. I can feel Commander players practically peeing themselves already thinking about the tutoring they can do with this. In standard, this is an interesting ability. Since she's a 1-3, it's pretty clear this isn't meant for an aggressive strategy. I'm thinking more along the lines of a control shell. This provides some decent early game toughness and lets you find the right counter spells, removal, pretty much anything else you need. She gives you a bit of freedom to main deck some more situational answers than usual, since you can swap the ones you don't need for the ones you do. You don't get to use the ability until turn 4, at least most of the time, but in a control deck, that should be fine. I'm not saying the Disciple is going to be a staple right now, but I wouldn't be surprised to see people try to build around her post-rotation. Plus, for all you loyal Demir players, you've got to be happy you have a card without Mill, right? I mean, how long has it been? Rejoice in your tutoring ways once more. It's a step in the right direction, if nothing else. Today had a load of spoilers. I think what we learned is that the limited format is going to be pretty great this time around with the addition of Journey into Nyx. Have you guys started brewing any sweet strategies yet? I'd love to hear what you're all thinking. Remember to subscribe below for the latest and most reliable Journey into Nyx spoiler information you could ever need. This is the Mana Source. I'm Wedge. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.